All right, welcome everyone to today's uh, session for the uh, for the 2022 GNEM Speaker Series sponsored by the Neuromuscular Disease Foundation. Very excited to have you all here today. My name is Noah Weisleder. I'm a professor and director of graduate studies in physiology and cell biology at The Ohio State University. And it, it's my pleasure today to moderate this session. Uh, this session uh, will uh, be open for questions at the end of the, the session. If you'd like to ask any questions, you can either, uh, you, uh, we prefer you use the Q and A uh, that you should be able to access at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can also use the chat box as well. Either one will work, but uh, the Q and A would be preferred. So if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to add them in there and I will administer the session at the end. Uh, you can of course keep your questions for the end as well. I'm sure that'll be great too. Uh, we're really hopeful that you'll have some great questions on what's gonna be a, a wonderful lecture today on, on a very important topic. So we're very excited today to have uh, one of our uh, uh, funded scientists here, uh, Dr. Rudiger Horschkorit uh, was a, uh, originally got his doctorate from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich uh, and has risen through the ranks to become professor of physiological chemistry at Martin Luther University, where he's done some really uh, seminal work, important work done in glycobiology that's focused on the function of glycans and glycoproteins in a variety of different disease states and different types of physiological phenomena. Uh, his work recently is focused on the biosynthetic pathway and the role of sciatus in development, aging, tumor genesis, and of course, our topic today, GNE myopathy. That's led the NDF to fund some of his research and development of a sensitive and robust enzyme assay for GNE, which is a really important step forward in the development of a lot of different types of therapeutic uh, approaches for the treatment of GNEM. So this is really a key work that's being done in his laboratory that's uh, really helpful in moving the field forward towards uh, treatment for GNE myopathy. And today he's going to give us a very interesting lecture on post-translational modifications of GNE. Uh, so we're excited to have him today, and I'll turn the virtual podium over uh, for you to give your talk. So we look forward to it. Okay, so welcome everybody. So my topic today is uh, post-translational modification of the GNE. The GNE, of course, is uh, a very important enzyme. Probably, or I'm sure that all of you know the GNE the key enzyme of the silic acid biosynthesis and post-translational modifications are any modifications which occur on proteins after the synthesis or so after the translation. And today I will focus on two distinct types of uh, post-translational modification and also to the role of the, uh, of the uh, function of the GNE on this post-translational modification. So, before I really will start, I will show you where I am or where we are. So we are in Germany and the city is Halle, which is here, you see here. So here is Berlin, Hamburg and Munich. And this is our marketplace. And uh, this is not a church. This is a, a single tower. And this tower hosts the world, I think the world, largest clarion and this is a kind of instrument with bells which you can play and this is a very interesting sound of course and this guy here here this person on this monument here this is Georg Friedrich Händel and he was born in Halle and he's of course a very very bar uh, famous baroque composer composer so here we are and now I will come to silic acid and to the GNE and to make it very short. Um, in principle, there's no life without silic acid, at least probably no mammalian life. And the person you see here, this is Martina Schwarzkopf, not a picture from now, but a picture from 2002, where we published this paper. And this is, of course, one of the, my, let's say, not the key paper of the GNE, but one of my key papers of the GNE, because this was the first hint that GNE is very important because we did a classical knockout and Martina was a PhD student at this time. So this was my start. This is exactly 20 years ago. I started with GNE research 25 years ago, and uh, I will 
even show you some of these very old experiments soon in some minutes. But before I come to this, I would like to introduce silic acid. You see here the, the structure of silic acid, but in principle, you have to know that silic acid is not a molecule. Silic acid is uh, or represents, or the term silic acid represents a family of sugars, and all these sugars have all nine carbon atoms. You see here, from one to nine. And in principle, this is not a sugar which is needed for energy metabolism. This is a sugar which is needed for, for structural components of glycoconjugates. And this sugar mediates, or these sugars mediate molecular interactions. And uh, this family is pretty large. So there are more than 50 members of this family, but there are some very important members. And the most important you see here, is this is n acetylenuminic acid or new 5 ac And this is a major silic acid in humans. And um, therefore, most of the, of the uh, things I tell you today concerning mammalians, this silic acid is n acetylenuminic acid. But there are many different um, chemical groups which can be attached to different uh, carbon atoms. And all this makes then this huge family of this silic acid. And to complete this, it's very important also to know that um, in mice, there is no n acetylenuminic acid, but n glucolinuminic acid, which is in principle, from the from the uh, from the evolution, a precursor of the n acetylenuminic acid. So, keep in mind, this is very important that silic acid is needed as a structural component, and you find this structural component um, on glycoproteins, for example, also on, on glycolipids. You see here the cartoon is from the essential of glycobiology. This is a membrane, of course, here, the bilayer. And uh, this red line here is a protein. And on these proteins, on consensus sequences, there can glycans be attached. And uh, since these glycans, when they are attached on asparagin by, uh, by, by N, N NH2 groups, these are N glycans, and uh, the N glycans are built up after a certain uh, module plan. And what is important that normally silic acid, which is here this purple diamond, is attached as an outer sugar. And whenever you come to a cell, yeah, this is a picture of the cell. This is a membrane here, this is the intracellular part. And this are here the sugars, which you cannot see like this here, of course. And in principle, all terminal sugars are silic acids. And therefore, when you attach a protein, a glycosylated protein, which contains a full glycan uh, or a cell, you always see silic acid first. So as here mentioned somehow. There are not only N-glycans, there are also O-glycans, which are attached on serine or threonine. And um, there are, of course, also glycolipids, um, which are not really shown here, which are also very important components for cell-cell interactions. Now we come to the biosynthesis of silic acid and then, of course, to the uh, G and E molecule itself. You see here a cartoon, and uh, it is very important to know that the uh, specific pathway of the silic acid biosynthesis starts with UDP and acetylglucosamine, which is in short UDP glucnac. And this glucnac is in principle, in the chemical reaction, which follows then is an epimerization. So one uh, OH group is just changed from one position to the other. So, and then from Glucknack, Nanak will be, um, will be formed. And the energy comes from the UDP. So the Glucknack has to be activated before. And the first step is this 
generation of n acetyl manosamine or short MANAC. The MANAC is then phosphorylated to MANAC 6 phosphate. Manac, this is a very um, unique, not unique, a very uh, often used way to activate uh, sugars. So the uh, phosphorylation in 6 position. Also, glucose is, for example, phosphorylated in uh, pos position 6. And then we have the activated MANAC, so MANAC 6 phosphate. And from there, on there are only a few steps further and uh, the first one is uh, that um, also in a pyruvid is needed to build new 5ac9 phosphate and this is then dephosphorylated and then we have already the final silic acid in this case when it's a human uh, we have n um, so uh, n acetyl neuromelic acid or new 5ac and the black, uh, the red, <laughs> red uh, line here shows the reaction of the GNEs. And as I mentioned, this is a bifunctional enzyme. There are two reactions. First is epimerization and then the phosphorylation. What is in principle very important for the uh, further biosynthesis of silic acid, and this is really unique, is that uh, silic acid, or in this case, new 5 ac is activated in the nucleus. All other sugars are not activated in the, in the nucleus. They are activated in the cytosol, but new 5 ac is activated in the nucleus, and it's activated by CMP, which is also very unique. Most sugars are not, so all other sugars are activated by, uh, by GDP or UDP. So this is a very important step, what happens after the generation of mu 5 ac And then you see there are two possible ways. The normal way in mammals, in mice, for example, is then that there's a hydrolase, and this hydrolase generates mu 5 gc And mu 5 gc the activated, is then transferred in the Golgi apparatus where Cellular transferases, and we have 20 cellular transferases which form glycoproteins and glycolipids. And these um, cellular transferases then transfer the activated neuromelic acid on its target. In this case, this is galactose, but it can be also a lipid and another sugar following. And in case of humans, um, this happens not. We use the final new 5 ac which is uh, activated in the nucleus here, because we lost the, this enzyme around 2 million years ago. So this enzyme we lost, and therefore we have new 5 ac and this new 5 ac can then also transport it, of course, in the Golgi. And you see here this salic acid and is then transferred to glycoproteins. And what is important to know is that we have a feedback inhibition. So CMP, neuromatic acid, interferes with the function of the GNE and reduces its function. So this is a classical feedback inhibition. So that the, the product, the end product of the pathway regulates the biosynthesis in the, in the beginning. So now we come to the GNE biopsy, and probably this I don't have to explain at all, but of course, this belongs into such a presentation. So the, the GNE myopathy is a rare autosomal recessive hereditary disease. And uh, of course, it's you know that it's a, a progress atrophy of the skeletal muscle tissues. And what is very important and really not known why this is so is that the first symptoms uh, raise between the age of, let's say, 20 and, and 30 in, in, in general. The prevalence is very low, so it's less than 100, one of 100,000. And the postulated cause of the disease, this is very important, and uh, this was found by um, Stella. Mitrani um, Rosenbaum, at the same time when we did the knockout of the GME mouse, is um, that it's probably due to a number, a huge number of different homozygous and heterozygous mutations in the GME, GME gene. And this 
in the end is resulting in hypothyroidation of glycans and this affects somehow the muscle. On the right side, you see prob probably this well-known picture of the, of the um, paper of Carillo et al. Where you see um, uh, MRI imaging and uh, you see here really the, the loss of muscle tissue during the um, progression of the GNE myopathy. But anyway, it's not really clear what is, it's only the postulated cause of disease. So what is really the, 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 the reason for the GNE myopathy is really still under discussion. Um, this is from a, a paper of uh, Stefan Hinderlich et al. And this is a, a, um, a table again of Stefan Hinderlich and uh, Penner et al. in 2006, where they analyzed a lot of these variants, of this GME variants. You see here the, the nomenclature. This is uh, unfortunately because it was 2006, the, let's say, old nomenclature. In the meantime, the numbers here, you have to add 30, 31 because uh, there is a new, uh, there was a new transcript found and therefore the, uh, the numbering changed. But anyway, this is the old, these are the old numbers. But in general, you see drop of activity either in the epimerase activity or in the kinase activity. And what is also very important is, is that the mutations are spread over the whole protein. So the, you see here the epimerase domain, more or less here the kinase domain, and you find uh, mutations in the gene in all parts of the, of the molecule. So in principle, you, we have to understand, of course, how the GNE is at all regulated. Uh, because when we understand the regulation uh, of the GNE, we could also interfere with the activity of the GNE. And uh, there are several possibilities. The first, of course, is the expression. Um, the expression of the GNE is very low in principle. The, the highest expression is in liver and in muscle, the expression is not so high. Therefore, the expression is, of course, uh, very limited or limits the, the amount of the, um, of the protein and by this, of course, the, um, the activity of the enzyme. What is a bit forgotten is uh, this very, very old uh, presentation here. This is again by Stefan Hinerlich. Um, perhaps I should mention Stefan, because Stefan, together with Roger Stesche, these were two PhD students in the 90s, very long ago, and they had two tasks. The first was uh, to purify the epimerase, and the second to purify the kinase, and they did this, and later they found that this was one enzyme. And what they also found was, and we do not discuss this so intensively uh, at this time, um, that the um, monomer, so this is the old, really old presentation of uh, Stefan's PhD thesis, um, that the monomers of the GNE, so this is one GNE protein here, um, they build not only dimers, but also multimers. They showed this by centrifugation and so on. And these, um, let's say, formation of multimers also regulates the activity. So the larger the, um, the multimers are, so tetramers, or in this case, hexamers, they have more enzymatic activity. At that time, um, the enzyme assays were not so sensitive. And uh, Stefan first thought that only, uh, or that dimers, as shown here, have only kinase activity. But in principle, this is not completely true. We can also have, of course, um, epimerase activity without having vitamins. Of course, we have also a feedback inhibition. I discussed this before, um, but this feedback inhibition also is only important, of course, when you have enough 
uh, product when there's enough CMP salic acid already produced. Um, maybe just for your interest, um, there's also another disease which is called siluria, where the feedback inhibition is mutated or the, uh, the two amino acids which are important for binding the products so CMP salic acid and this binding then reduces the activity. This, uh, this uh, amino acids are mutated and this leads to permanent fully activated GNE and this leads to gram, really gram-wise production of silic acid. And this is also the name of this uh, disease, siluria, because these people really have gram-wise silic acid. And this is of course then filtrated by the kidneys and you find um, silic acid in the urine and that's the name for the disease, siluria. And what is of course, of interest is here shown now in red. This is post translate, or these are post translational modifications, and um, this is of course a very uh, widespread possibility to regulate um, the activity of enzymes. So many, many, many enzymes uh, are phosphorylated, for example, and uh, this phosphorylation leads to activation or sometimes to um, inhibition of the enzymatic activity. And therefore, we very, very early started with the analysis of post-translational modification. And this is here one of <laughs> the oldest slide I will show you. Um, this is from 2000, um, where we checked the phosphorylation of the GME, because we there are, of course, many possibilities or um, possible um, phosphorylation sites on the GNE, and uh, we checked for PKC phosphorylation. And uh, what is very easy here to see is that um, when you incubate um, the GNE protein, which we purified at that time from, um, from insect cells, overexpressing insect cells, and when we then incubated this uh, GNE, so you see here the, the GNE, the loading controls of this, this, um, this autoradiogram. And uh, you see that when you add PKC in this case, and also PMA or no PMA, you find phosphorylation. And when you interfere the PKC with stauroporin, then you have no phosphorylation of the GNE. Um, this was time dependent, and we really could see that gene is phosphorylated by PKC. This PKC was not produced by ourselves or purified by ourselves. This was uh, a commercial product. The only commercial product was which was uh, available at that time. So when we knew that GNE is phosphorylated, we immediately uh, came to another point, the opposite or another possibility to, um, to modify a protein on the same amino acids on serine or threonine. And this is the modification with oglucnac. You see here the schematic scheme, what ha can happen to a protein. You have here the naked protein and with the kinase and ATP, you can phosphorylate this protein on serine or threonine because you, you need a OH group for this. And there are phosphatases which can remove the phosphate. And in principle, this phosphorylation can activate or inactivate an enzyme or a protein, both is possible. But on the other way, this is a very, very important work from Jerry Hart over the last, let's say, 30 years. Uh, proteins can be also modified by oglucnac. And this is very important because this is not a, a phosphate, but this is a glycosylation. The glycosylation or a sugar is attached, only one sugar, and this is glucnac on a serine or serine. And this can be the same amino acids like here, but 
it could be also different ones. And there's an enzyme, the oglucnac transferase, and in contrast to kinases, this is only one enzyme where we have a lot of different kinases, and we have an oglucnac case, the enzyme which can remove the oglucnac from the protein, and in the end we have again a naked protein. And also the oglucnaculation can of course modify the acti activity of any, any protein either the oglucnaculation itself or by interfering with the phosphorylation because oglucnaculation in any case also interferes with phosphorylation because a, 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 a serine or theramine which is oglucnaculated cannot be phosphorylated of course. And uh, you see here in this, uh, in this plot that precipitate, uh, immunoprecipitated uh, GNE is oglucnaculated and um, in the meantime also mass spec data are available that GNE contains oglucnac. So there is of course a, um, a post-translational modification, so both phosphorylation and also oglucnaculation of course are post-translational modification and both are happen or happens on the GNE. Now I would like just to make the story more complex, um, present you UDP glucnac because UDP glucnac is really a fantastic molecule because it's a kind of, let's say, master metabolite because you need all pathways to build up UDP glucnac. And what is of course also very important, UDP glucnac, remember, is the substrate of the GNE itself. So UDP glucnac is a substrate of the enzyme and UDP glucnac can be used as substrate to modify the GNE. And you see that of course to have, you need glucose. So the glucose metabolism is important to build uh, UDP glucnac. Um, so these are the first steps here of the glycolysis. Then you have fructose 6-phosphate, and then you need glutamine. And glutamine comes, of course, from the amino acid metabolism. So we have the sugars and the amino acids. Then you need the acetyl group to acetylate it and to get an, uh, an acetyl glucosamine. This is from the fatty, bed, uh, fatty, fatty acid metabolism, um, the acetyl groups. So you combine glucose, amino acid, and fatty acid. And when you have the glucnac, you have to activate it, of course, it with UTP, and this includes then the nucleotide metabolism. And so together, UDP glucnac combines all metabolic, major metabolic pathways of the cell, of course. So it's a really very nice molecule. So now we come uh, again to the uh, to the GNE and now to one variant of the GNE, the M743T variant, which is the former 712 or 712 variant, the same only another numbering. Um, and you, you see here, this is the, the old um, nomenclature. You see that this has a certain chance to be phosphorylated. And when you look to all the mutations which can occur in the GNE myopathy, you find quite a lot of uh, variants, protein variants later, which can be phosphorylated. Or where the possibility for different post-translational modifications are there. And phosphorylation, there are only really, let's say, good programs to analyze phosphorylation. But of course, amino acids, which can be phosphorylated, can also be oglucnac related. So you see here the two uh, variants, the Y-type variants and the M743T variant. This is the GNE itself, overexpressed in CHO cells. You see here the phosphorylation, so the phosphoblot, where you see that these two proteins have the same signal, at least. You see here also the loading control, the actin loading control. But you see a huge difference in the oglucna content. So the UDP, um, the M743T 
T variant has much more UDP gluconide than the wild type variant. Um, we then analyzed the activity of this enzyme, or Dovid Benman did this some years ago. And you see here the wild type GNE and the, uh, the variant, so the uh, GNE myopathy variant. And you see a reduction of the uh, enzymatic activity. When this is treated with phosphatase, you see more or less no different, so difference. So the wild type enzyme has more or less the same activity. Also the mutated, it's a bit higher, but when you use Ogluchna case, so now I go back again, remember this variant has more UDP, more Gluknak, Ogluchnak than the wild type. So when you remove this, then you have much more activity. So in this case, one could argue that um, oglucnaculation of the GNE reduces the activity. And in the, in the wild type and also in the, in, the, uh, in the mutated variant, and when you remove it, then you have more activity without increasing the amount of the environment. You only digested this here with Ogluchna case. And now uh, I will really completely switch a bit the, uh, not the topic, but I will not talk about uh, phosphorylation and oglucnaculation anymore, but I will introduce a specific pathway, biochemical pathway, which is used in, uh, in all tissues and all cells, of course, uh, but in muscles, there's a lot of glycolysis, of course. Like this is here a very short uh, diagram of the glycolysis. You know that muscle um, has a lot of uh, glycogen, and the glycogen is, is more, let's say, saved glucose, a huge uh, um, um, molecule which contains several thousand of glucose molecules. And this is a, a, a very important energy source of muscle. So muscle makes or does a lot of uh, glycolysis. Um, this is a flow of, of the glycolysis. So glucose is phosphorylated and later uh, fructose 6-phosphate uh, is generated. And again, it's phosphorylated and then we have uh, fructose 2,6 uh, bisphosphate, and this is then splitted. And in glycerin aldex 3 phosphate and dehydroxyacetone phosphate. So this is a normal textbook knowledge. And later from here, energy is formed, ATP is formed for the contra muscle contraction, of course. But what is not known, uh, people forget this, is that there is a side product um, and a very regular side product in muscle and also in other cells. And this is uh, methylglyoxal. And so you see here the, the structure of methylglyoxal. And methylglyoxal, I will come to this later, is uh, not very good, not very healthy. It's uh, it, uh, damaged proteins. And therefore, we have a detoxifying uh, system. Uh, which is glyoxylase 1 and glyoxylase 2, and these two enzymes um, metabolize methylglyoxal to lactate, and then it's neutralized. So keep this in mind, muscles make a lot, need a lot of glucose, make a lot of glycolysis, and therefore have also a lot of methylglyoxal. So now I, I come to, to, to the aging, because this is, uh, for me, it's very yeah, interesting and important to understand or trying to understand why uh, GNE myopathy occurs later in life, not directly from birth. Because this is, uh, for, for, for me as a biochemist, it's really difficult to understand. Because many, many of the um, uh, genetic diseases which are uh, concerned the synthesis or transport of, of sugars or, or, and glycans affect the, the, the individuals directly from, from birth on or even before. Because 
these sugars are important when they are needed for structures. So what could be the reason that, let's say, in this age, gene emeropathy starts? And, oh, sorry. Uh, and with this, I would like to show you here some, <laughs> some pictures. And uh, this is um, a protein, and this is collagen. So when you just isolate collagen from different ages, you see that it becomes darker and darker. So this is collagen from very, very young children. And this is collagen from a 100 years old person. So it becomes really brown. And uh, this is a reaction, um, sorry, which is uh, called glycation. And uh, glycation is a post-translational modification. And interestingly, or this is also a big difference to phosphorylation or glucnaculation and all the other post-translational modification. This is a post-translational modification which do not, or which, which does not need any enzymes. So this is just a chemical reaction. But this chemical reaction occurs in all of our bodies. And you see this uh, scheme here. This is a protein with amino group. And you see here glucose. And this glucose can react with the amino group. So here, the carbonyl group of the glucose can react, form a shift space. And with later, um, this can uh, rearrange to a called uh, to an Amadori product. And this reaction here is the so-called Maillard reaction. This is a chemical reaction. You see, this is uh, can happen in both directions. But later, when this uh, rearrangement happened, there's no way back. So the protein has this modification. And uh, carbonyls are the normal molecules which react with amino groups here. And methyl glyoxyl, which I showed you, which occurs during the uh, glycolysis, is a very, very potent uh, agent for glycation. So it's more than 10,000 fold more active than glucose. And this is uh, due to the reason that glucose here is shown in the open form and only the open form reacts with amino groups. So the, the ring form, the, you know, show glucose in the Harvard form, which is normal, the normal uh, glucose in, uh, in water. Uh, this cannot react. You need the, the free carbon group. And probably uh, because this is uh, glucose is only in less than 0.1% in the open form. This is also the reason why we use glucose as energy transporter in the body. Because when, we, when glucose would have this open form all the time, it is, would be much too reactive and all the proteins would be glycated. So in principle, protein glycation is the dark, dark side of, uh, of sugars. And uh, this happens, this is glycation, which happens at 37 degrees over, let's say, 70 or 100 years you know, with proteins. And uh, collagen is, of course, a very nice molecule to show because collagen has a very, very long half-life. So uh, some of the collagen is as old as you are, and it becomes darker and darker. This is like the uh, um, bread baking, so the, the crest, bread crest, which becomes dark, is also glycation. It's not burning, it's a glycation. So you can speed up this when you increase the temperatures. This is not really uh, compatible with light, but when you do it in, 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 the, in, in the oven with bread, with 200 degrees, for example, Celsius degrees, then you need only two hours, then you have the, the, the dark as uh, the, the light here to the dark. Okay, and now I would like to show you some data from the lab. And this uh, is now really, un this is unpublished work. So we have the data more or less complete, but still it's unpublished. And uh, what we did is we used methylglyoxone um, for glycating gene. Um, and what we had is uh, purified epimerase, 
you see here in the pulses, so this is just a, a protein staining. You incubated this with different amount of methylglyoxone. And um, you should know that in some tissues up to 500 micromoles, so in this case 0.5 millimole of methylglyoxone, can happen. So this concentration is uh, nearly a physiological uh, concentration. Two micromole and five micromole is really very high, but we used this for testing our system. And um, then we checked this by uh, by Western blood, the glycation, and there is a very specific antibody which uh, recognize the uh, glycated structure, which is formed by a GO or NGO. And you see here the Western blot signal, and here is the quantification of the signal. And I hope that you believe me that the, um, the protein, in this case, the epimerase, is glycated when you add methyl glyoxal. So, and now we analyzed the activity of the epimerase. And this was done by a very, not very sensitive assay, but this works quite well. Uh, it's a not non-radioactive uh, assay, but this act, uh, assay works only when you have purified protein. And this is very easy. Um, it's a commercial product you, you can buy um, and, uh, yeah, do, do, do this essay. This is from Pomega. And um, what happens is that the UDP Glucknack is, of course, uh, metabolized to MANAC. And this is here. And UDP is formed, generated. And there is a UDP glow reagent. And with this, with the help of ATP, you can detect light. It's, it's very easy. And in principle, you only measure the generation of UDP, not the generation of MANAC, but the generation of UDP. But since you have a purified protein and you have the UDP uh, looking at epimerase domain there, then the UDP comes, of course, from the UDP glucose because you have all these compounds in the, in the assay. So, and what you see here is the activity after glycation. And in principle, there is a drop, but uh, let's say the drop is very low, the so activity. So this is 100% or relative activity of one with without glycation, and when you have 0.5 millimolar MDO-treated uh, epimerase, it's more, more or less the same. And even at two uh, millimolar MDO, it's, it's not significant, only at five millimolar. So in principle, the epimerase domain, um, you can glycate the domain or the, the enzyme, but the enzyme activity is not changed, sorry. Now we did the same with the MANAC kinase. And the MANAC kinase, um, you see the, the same experiment. We have here the, the, the kinase domain. We glycated them with the same concentration. We showed this, this with, the same, with the antibody in the Western blot. And this is a quantification. So in principle, again, I hope you believe me that uh, glycation is uh, MGO leads here really to the formation of this uh, product, which is in principle what I have forgotten. Um, the, the glycation, the product of the glycation are so-called advanced glycation end product. So when you want to name this here, you can say, okay, this is a formation of advanced glycation end product. So, but, but what you see here now is the activity. And again, this is a non-radioactive activity because we can do it because we have a purified enzyme and we can uh, use purified uh, products. So uh, the, the reaction scheme is shown here. So you have the, um, the MANAC, you need ATP, you have the, the kinase. Sorry that here Glückner kinase is written. Of course, it's the MANAC kinase, which should be shown here. Uh, 
what happens is then you have monarch 6 phosphate and ADP. Then you have a net next reaction where you use the ADP uh, together with phosphoenol pyruvate with the pyruvate kinase. Then you have to generate pyruvate and ATP. And the pyruvate plus NADH, you can, um, from this, you can generate lactate. This is the same reaction like in the, in the glycolysis. Then lactate is generated and from NADH, NAD is generated. And this you can measure very easy in any photometer. And uh, this is the result, dramatic result. So the um, glycation of the monarch kinase really dramatically decreases the activity of the monarch kinase. For control, we did the same experiment. And that's the reason, sorry here, why I, because I just copied this. Uh, we did this with a Glucknack kinase. The Glucknack kinase uh, does the same reaction, but not with Manak, but with, with, uh, with, uh, with Glucknack. And uh, we, we did the same reaction with this, and we did also the glycation. I, I haven't shown now here the Western blot, but believe me, it looked like the uh, ephemerase and Manak kinase domain. So you can really very wonderful glycate them. And you see here again, the glucnac kinase is also not modified or the activity is not changed by glycation. So coming to some take home messages, um, I hope you believe me that salic acids are structure and structural components of glycoconjugates and that GNE is a key enzyme of the salic acid biosynthesis. Rotations within the gene of the GNE are most probably responsible for, for the GNE myopathy. And the activity is, of the GNE is regulated by the assembly of monomers. I haven't shown you data, but there are some data you can find in the literature from Stefan Hinderlich by feedback inhibition with CMP salic acid. This is, of course, not really important for GNE myopathy, but maybe the assembly and by post-translational modification and in the end by glycation and aging. And um, yeah, with this, uh, I would like to come to an end. So there is no mammalian life without salic acid and in this time, but there is the basis for human life is not salic acid, but it's peace, freedom and tolerance. And please don't forget this in this time. And I would like to thank you now very much for attending my presentation and thanks to my team here in Halle. The data I presented, which are the, uh, the unpublished, are uh, performed by Vanessa Hagenhaus. She's the MD student in the lab. Uh, Kaya Borg is my Mr. g and &E. He is a postdoc since many, many, many years and it's my technician. The former, former members, Martina Schwarzkopf, is the, you know, the starting point because she generated the knockout. Nicola, Wenke, and Dorit did some of the DNE work. My work is mainly funded, or all these things I showed you uh, was funded by the uh, DFG, the German Research Foundation, by a lot of, let's say, grants also aging grants. Yeah, and uh, I think that's it. A question about the post-translation modifications. Uh, what, does, uh, what does it mean, uh, post-translation modifications, that is, what does it mean towards uh, manic-based treatment? I assume that's sort of manic supplementation. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is a good question. Um, and actually, I, I don't know, of course. There, there is a, this is a very important point with the Manak supplementation. Um, because in, in principle, we thought uh, when we generated this uh, GNE knockout mouse more than 20 years ago, that we could, could rescue the phenotype by adding or by feeding the mice Manak. Because this 
we, we we knew that mana can be phosphorylated by other uh, kinases and so on. But in principle, we were not successful at that time. We, we tried hard to, uh, to, to, um, to treat these uh, animals with monarch. So we used drinking waters and we also injected monarch in, in mice, in pregnant mice, uh, and were not successful. All animal died in, let's say, between embryonic day eight and 12, 13, but before birth. So uh, in, in principle, I do not know. So I, I'm a bit skeptical about the, the, the Manak treatment. And uh, up to now, the Manak uh, studies are also not really convincing. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about this, but in, in, in principle, um, we had, of course, we do not have the possibility to interfere with, let's say, phosphorylation or, or gluconaculation, because all proteins, all, nearly any enzyme is phosphorylated. And uh, to, to use, uh, let's say, unspecific phosphorylation inhibitors or, or things like this would interfere in all regulatory mechanism of any biological reaction so this does not work and we do not have of course specific inhibitors or um, uh, molecules which interfere only with gme modifications this is unfortunately not possible right no it's certainly the case uh with the o like nylation taking place so, so what do you think that's actually doing to the uh, protein maybe, I mean, this is a very nice biochemical data. Do you think it's having an effect also at the cell biological level? Is it uh, affecting localization of the enzyme or something like that? Could that explain some of the impact uh, once you get out of the uh, biochemical assay? Yeah. Yeah, this is a good, also a good question. And yes, it could be. Uh, what we realized when we um, had this uh, variance in cell culture, only in cell culture can I have data, um, okay. that the, uh, when we centrifuge the supernatants, normally GNE is in the cytosol. So this is text, textbook knowledge. And when you stain GNE, normally you have it in the cytosol. But the uh, the variants um, are more in the in the pellet. So at, when you centrifuge this, you have this in, in pellet. So therefore, the localization of some of the very variants of the GNE myopathy variants are changed definitely but it's there is up to my knowledge no systematic study um, on the really localization and of the of all this variance in cell culture right yeah no i'd agree with that i wonder if it ends up in the uh, potentially being trafficked you know through some mm -hmm. vesicle compartment which it normally wouldn't be in and it can't get out of it as a result yeah I mean, that's yeah. been but seen some, we have yeah. no data on this so i'm sorry sure no that makes sense uh, let's see, there's a question. Uh, there was a sialic acid trial in the USA. Could you shed some light on why the trial did not show improvement in the muscles? <laughs> Actually, I was not involved in any of the trials, uh, but I, I know, of course, the people which are involved in the trials. Um, my hypothesis is that it's very, very difficult to get the uh, this monarch into the target cells. So if you eat monarch, for example, and this, I, I think the people did this gram-wise, and then um, you have to pass several, um, let's say, um, cell layers. And I'm not sure that you really reach any, so there was no proof, from, from my knowledge, that uh, monarch really reaches muscle cells. Um, and this is uh, a problem for all supplementation. Um, trials because the the cells before so the epithelium in 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 the, in the gut and they 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 take when they take it then they keep it and then they phosphorylate it and then they never will give it away so I think it's very difficult to get really higher levels of monarch or salic acid in 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 the blood and when you have in the blood some salic acid more and you can measure this it's very difficult to get this salic acid out of the blood into muscle cells so i would say it's nearly impossible 
it boils down to a bioavailability concern for that sort of transport. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also was curious. So it was very interesting results with the uh, glycination of the uh, of, of various kinases that you were showing. So, what, what do you think is going on there? Is it is it a situation where you're affecting uh, formation of multimer or, or monomers into higher molecular weight structures, or is it is it just glomming on mm -hmm. and affecting the catalytic pocket? Or do you have an idea what might be the effect there? So we, 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 you can check it by yourself and we checked it, uh, I haven't shown this. So there are many lysines, normally lysines are glycated because they have the amino groups. Uh, there are many lysines, of course, um, there's no lysine really in the, in the enzymatic pocket. So it, in principle, uh, it's known that many, uh, many proteins lose their, their function after glycation. And one very important, uh, medical example is of course hemoglobin so this hemoglobin 1c which is the glycated hemoglobin and you can measure this and you can uh, really measure the uh, the long-term glucose concentration in the blood because hemoglobin is also a protein which has a half-life of over 100 days and this is again it, it does not work so well when it's glycated but nobody knows why but in principle uh, there also exists after uh, also glycation leads also to the formation of um, multimers, unspecific multimers, which are then chemical linked somehow. And probably you just destroy the, the, the structure. Yeah. And that is the key to protein function after all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I have another question here from the audience. Uh, that question is, if a MANAC trial is successful, when will it be available for the general public? Does, again, I'm very sorry that I was not involved in this, uh, but um, I think it's not available for the, for the public. I'm really I'm sorry to say this. Um, my my mentor, my former mentor, is dead already, Werner Reuter. When we published this in 2002, um, he, he is a medical doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. He was allowed to um, to give patients sugars. Uh, he already tried this 20 years ago, and it was not not successful. So I'm I'm again I'm very skeptical about this. I'm very sorry. Fair enough. Oh, uh, I guess the uh, oh another question. Let's this will be the last one right at the hour. But uh, there's a question: Would either a manic or sialic pro drug help in the absorption? Uh, presumably yeah. as a therapeutic yeah. approach. Of course, you can uh, try to get the uh, the molecules manac, for example, uh, better into cell and uh, cells, and you can do it by acetylation, for example, or pair acetylation. So then it's more uh, it's easier to pass the membrane and then it, it can enter the cell and we also did this in cell culture many, many very often and this works very well so it enters the cell then esterases will cleave off uh, the acetyl groups and you have the manac in and you need only 100 so 100 or 1000 of the of the un acetylated form so it's much much better but again uh, this is then trapped in the first epithelium layer and it is very difficult to get this even the product into the muscle because in this first cell and this is not the muscle the first cell will cleave off all the stuff and you will have the the drug in the first cell and not in the muscle this is again a problem. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a delivery, the delivery into the muscle. I think it's really a problem. That is an outstanding challenge, and hopefully, uh, we will continue to pursue efforts to do that. So, thank you for a very intriguing lecture and a robust question answer period afterwards. We appreciate yeah. that and, and all the work that you do to uh, help move the field forward. I would like to remind all the attendees that uh, we'll have another session coming up uh, next month as well. That'll be uh, Dr. Suda Bhattacharya, uh, who will do a presentation 
about the potential therapeutic options for GNA myopathy, lessons from other muscle diseases. Uh, she is a professor at Ashkoa University in India. So we're excited to have her coming in and talking about potential therapeutics for GNE. So uh, thank you again for our uh, to our presenter today. And everyone have an excellent day.